Hello friends, I am Dr. Pankaj Anand and I am working as a senior consultant in the Department of Critical Care at Fortis Hospital Jaipur. You know, uh, the extracorporeal forms of therapy, including ECMO and other forms, are finding great utility in treating various disorders in modern medicine. One of them is the ECCO2R or the extracorporeal removal of carbon dioxide. And it, it is actually proving to be very promising uh, in uh, patients with CO2 uh, narcosis in other patients. And it has the potential of completely eliminating or at least partially eliminating the use of uh, mechanical ventilation, especially in patients of type 2 respiratory failure. Now, over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to discuss the various nuances of ECCO2R. And let me start with a small case history. This was actually a 53-year-old lady, a known case of COPD, who came to us with an acute exacerbation following an upper respiratory tract infection and presented with type 2 respiratory failure. At admission, she had a pH of 7.17 with a carbon dioxide of 84. The patient was hemodynamically stable and was responsive, but was dull. We initially put her on BiPAP, but after four to five hours of BiPAP support, her condition actually did not improve. It started worsening. Her PACO2 went on going up and she became more and more drowsy. We also realized that she had given an express uh, directive not to be put on a ventilator, not to be intubated. But this was not a case of palliative care. We were dealing with a reversible disease process and she wanted to live. Now, what do you do in such a situation? Dear friends, this is a typical condition where you start thinking about ECCO2R or the extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal, which as you know, is a technique whose objective is to decarboxylate blood, thereby correcting hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis. It is very similar to ECMO, but uses lower blood flow, usually less than 1.5 liters per minute. Now, initially ECCO2R was developed in the treatment of patients with ARDS, but as technique improved, ECCO2R is now being proposed as a therapeutic option in cases of hypercapnic respiratory failure, either during acute and severe decompensation of COPD or in patients of ARDS, mainly to achieve less or no mechanical ventilation. Now, if you look at the position of ECCO2R in the universe of extracorporeal therapy, you'll realize that, of course, it is useful in type 2 respiratory failure in patients with COPD. It also is important in patients of ARDS where you want to give ultra protective uh, lung ventilation and do not want the carbon dioxide to build up. Now, Many expert centers, the devices used to provide ECMO and ECCO2R are more or less the same. And as I said, the main difference is the difference in the blood flow rates. In fact, many authors refer to ECCO2R as low flow ECMO just to acknowledge this continuum. Through extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal, a proportion of the total carbon dioxide production is cleared to allow reduction of mechanical ventilation, thereby allowing lung rest. Now, even though the original purpose of ECCO2R was to provide an additional carbon dioxide clearance in patients with severe ARDS in whom we wanted to reduce the tidal volumes and inspiratory pressure, it is now finding application in patients with COPD and as a bridge to transplant and in, and in order to facilitate thoracic surgery. Now, if you look at the gas exchange physiology of ECCO2R, we know that oxygen is mainly transported bound to hemoglobin rather than being dissolved. And this makes blood oxygenation largely dependent on blood flow. On the other hand, carbon dioxide exchange depends on ventilation. But when you talk about extracorporeal removal of carbon dioxide, it depends on the gas flow, which is termed here as the sweep gas. This sweep gas does not contain carbon dioxide and usually uh, is placed on the other side of the mem membrane, semi-permeable mem semi membrane to the blood, thereby creating a diffusion gradient, which allows carbon dioxide removal. Now, carbon dioxide removal at a fixed blood flow, therefore, depends upon the 
gas flow or the sweet gas flow and on the blood carbon dioxide content along with hemoglobin as well as the efficiency of the gas exchange membrane. The blood flow, of course, uh, is very important in carbon dioxide removal. Uh, actually, carbon dioxide removal in ECCO2R has exhibits a biphasic removal kinetics. So there is an initial rapid decline in PaCO2, which is secondary to the removal of dissolved carbon dioxide, followed by a more steady removal, uh, mainly because they're liberated from bicarbonates. Now, what? How does uh, an ECCO2R system work? They vary in characteristics, technology, and ability of gas exchange. So it could be a very simple uh, system like the renal dialysis system, which is a low blood flow and low prime volume, to partial extracorporeal support, up to systems which are capable of full ECMO support. Now, an extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal system consists of a circuit which has a percutaneously placed drainage cannula which is placed either in a large central vein where it becomes a VVECCO2R or in an artery when it becomes an AVECCO2R, uh, a membrane lung and a return cannula into the venous system. You will realize it is quite similar to what we use in ECMO. Now in cases of the AV system, it is the patient's own blood pressure which provides the driving pressure. Therefore, you do not need a pump in an AV system. However, in a veno-venous system, you do need a pump uh, in uh, the circuit. Uh, the blood comes out of the femoral vein in this case. It passes via the pump, goes to the membrane lung where carbon dioxide is removed and is then pushed back into the intrinsical vein. On the other hand, the AV system, the blood comes out of the artery, passes through the artificial lung, carbon dioxide gets removed, and the blood goes back into the vein. Now, assess cannula uh, uh, basically give access to the uh, circulation either through a separate arterial and venous cannula in an AV system or by using a double lumen cannula or in a VV system. There are various types of cannulae. I'm not going into the detail. But the key disadvantage of the AV approach is the need for arterial cannulation with the potential side effects of arterial injury and limb ischemia. Now, the cannula used for ECCO2R has the same set of complications as any central venous cannula, including the risk of vessel perforation leading to bleeding or damage to surrounding structures. A word about the membrane lung. In non-microporous polyformethylene one pentene or the PMP is usually used. It provides superior gas exchange, better biocompatibility and a lower resistance and is less susceptible to plasma leak. The gas exchange membrane is connected to air or oxygen, which acts as a sweep gas to remove the carbon dioxide as I told you earlier. Now this is how a, a filter looks like or works. So the blood containing carbon dioxide comes there is the filter membrane uh, across which there is the, uh, the sweet gas blowing. So there is a diffusion gradient here. So the carbon dioxide comes out and blood after carbon dioxide removal is then pushed back into the venous system. There are various types of pumps. I'm not going into the details. Uh, uh, pumps can be roller or peristaltic, which was the older system or rotary pumps, which can be diagonal or centrifugal. Now, what is the evidence for the efficacy of CO2 removal? You know, uh, regardless of whether AV or VV approach is used, these devices can actually remove enough carbon dioxide to allow an almost half reduction in minute alveolar ventilation with significant reduction in PaCO2 and subsequent reduction in pulmonary artery pressure and improvement in right ventricular arterial coupling. Now, uh, these are the various papers which have said this. In fact, uh, Levigny et al. in an adult sheep model were able to obtain a constant removal of carbon dioxide with an average 20 percent reduction with extracorporeal blood flow of 300 ml. Uh, other studies have proven almost the same findings. Now, in the mid, mid late or late 1970s, Gettinoni and Pesenti pioneered the use of VV ECCO2R. Uh, to allow low frequency ventilation and lung rest. And they actually uh, called it an alternative to breathing. They further uh, proved that in addition, these authors showed that the removal of one third of the basal carbon dioxide produced uh, 
can be removed through the extracorporeal circuit at flows of 400 to 600 ml per minute, thereby allowing, allowing uh, reduction of tidal volume, which is very, very important. Then there are other observational studies which have said the same, especially in patients with severe ARDS, ECCO2R does allow reduction in respiratory rate and inflation pressure while maintaining uh, carbon dioxide, low carbon dioxide levels and supporting oxygenation. Now, what is the clinical evidence of efficacy? Again, Gertinoni in 1980 showed that ECCO2R and ECMO with a low blood flow as low as 1.3 liters per minute drastically reduced ventilator ventilation need, thus limiting ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, more recent studies in humans have demonstrated that consistent evidence that PSCO2 can be reduced and arterial pH due to respiratory acidosis improved using ECCO2R. In fact, ECCO2R can effectively reduce PSCO2 in patients with ARDS, thereby allowing a reduction both in tidal volume and airway pressure and the lung injury due to ventilation. Now, talking specifically about the use of extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal in ARDS patients, almost one third of patients who received uh, the lung protective ventilation had evidence of tidal hyperinflation and hence lung injury. We've always said that permissive hypercapnia is allowed, but frankly, hypercapnia does cause significant physiological instability, including pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure, leading to a global low cardiac output state. In these patients, the addition of extracorporeal removal of carbon dioxide might allow control of hypercapnic respiratory acidosis and facilitate ultraprotective ventilation, thereby limiting and inspiratory lung stretch. Zimmerman et al. showed that when ECCO2R was used as a rescue in more severe ARDS, it actually achieved marked removal in arterial carbon dioxide, allowing a rapid reduction in tidal volume and inspiratory plateau pressure. <coughs> Recent studies have also proven that ECCO2R was feasible facilitating low tidal volume and uh, an increase in the ventilator free days in more severe ARDS. Talking specifically about COPD and severe COPD exacerbations, high airway resistance, VA ventilation, perfusion mismatch, dynamic hyperinflation and increased work of breathing with increased carbon dioxide production actually lead to hypercapnia. Therefore, the extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal is important as an adjunctive therapy to NIV to facilitate the withdrawal of NIV or to in avoid intubation or if the patient is already intubated to facilitate early extubation. ECCO2R actually this has been proven by a recent retrospectively propensity mass cohort where they said that ECCO2R was able to consistently reduce PSCO2, improve respiratory acidosis and reduce respiratory rate in 21 patients suffering from acute hypercapnic respiratory failure who were failing in IV, 90% of these patients uh, did not require intubation and invasive mechanical ventilatory support. And this was published in this multicenter study in intensive care medicine, uh, Stephen Kloog et al. Another recent study by Berkey, Berkey and colleagues in CHEST said that PSCO2 and pH actually improved within six hours and there were minimal major complications. All patients in whom the goal was intubation avoidance or weaning from NIV remained ventilator free and separated from NIV. Uh, again, a recent retrospective code study says that ECCO2R had lower intubation rates and actually reduced mortality uh, in these patients. So the argument of the use of the extracorporeal removal of carbon dioxide and exacerbation COPD are definitely compelling, even though we need more evidence. And in patients who are failing NIV and who do not want intubation, like our patients in our example, uh, and who are not into palliative care, it seems a reasonable approach. <clears throat> now, what is the role, possible role of ECCO2R in patients who are awaiting lung transplant? Uh, it is useful in those patients, uh, especially if they develop life-threatening hypercapnia, largely as a bridge transplantation. <clears throat> the major advantage of ECCO2R in this situation is the avoidance of intubation and mechanical ventilation, 
and the potential adverse equally continuation of physiotherapy and allowing the patient to remain autonomous. To date, we don't have much of randomized controlled trials, but in a study of 20 patients, hypercapnia and acidosis were effectively corrected in all patients within the first 12 hours of this CO2 hour therapy. 95% of these patients were successfully transplanted. So to conclude my talk, uh, technological advances in ECCO2R have created the opportunity for its extended role in partial extracorporeal CO2 removal. Further applications will involve smaller and more biocompatible systems for patients with moderate to severe ARDS, but also as a sole supportive modality in patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure, where you do not have to use ventilators. Of course, the potential complications need to be evaluated whenever you are con considering a patient for extracorporeal support. Dear friends, times are not far away where ECCO2R could potentially remove the need of invasive mechanical ventilation in a lot of sick patients, especially the patients with type 2 respiratory.